What's up guys, Michael here. The locked down, messed up era of the pandemic has made many of us reach for our televisual comfort foods to stay sane. For some, that means endless reruns of The West Wing or The Office. For others, it's the nice core antics of Paddington Bear or Ted Lasso. Anything that allows us to disappear into a gentler, more optimistic world. You know, I think that if you care about someone and you got a little love in your heart, there ain't nothing you can't get through together, you know what I'm saying? However, we're also way too messed up as a species to deal in a totally wholesome way. Which may explain why the last two years have also been an absolute boom time for horror. Now's when I start to buy my Halloween stuff. What am I not supposed to buy my Halloween stuff? Really? We've seen the continued resurrection of classics like Halloween, modern reimaginings of The Invisible Man, and viral sensations like Squid Game. Clearly, we can't help but dive into the most nightmarish fiction, even as the real world feels something like a horror movie of its own. Hello! Now, for those of us who, like me, absolutely do not partake in spooky content, this seems like a masochistic response. But as I've been surprised to learn, it's actually a tried and true way to respond to trauma on both a personal and societal scale. Allow me to explain in this wisecrack edition why we watch horror in horrible times. And spoiler alert, uh, scary movies are scary, uh, sometimes people die in them, and ghost. Now, by March of 2020, the pandemic had taken a hold over much of the world. Entire countries were brought to a standstill, streets were emptied, and hospitals were overrun. With a few notable exceptions, nobody seemed to have much of a handle on the situation. And in the midst of this waking nightmare, in which every day seemed to bring some fresh hell, Contagion became the most watched film in the US. That's right, after spending our days terrified of a pandemic tearing our world apart, we decided to spend the evening relaxing in front of a movie about a pandemic tearing our world apart. She's overreacting, right? Not really, and stop touching your face. And sure, Steven Soderbergh simply does not miss and we should exalt him even in times of national tragedy. But it's still fascinating that we collectively chose to spend our free time freaking out about death germs rather than enjoying, say, the relaxing charms of Ocean's Eleven or the gyrating delights of Magic Mike. But if we take a quick glance back across the history of horror cinema, it's actually not that unusual. In fact, the genre's most fertile periods have been born out of the most tumultuous and often straight up terrifying of times. Indeed, you can chase that trend all the way back to the early days of horror cinema itself. See, American horror films emerged in full force at the start of the 1930s in the midst of the Great Depression. 1930 through 1934 would later be known as the Golden Age of Horror. At a time when everyone was flat broke, what little cash they had went straight into the coffers of Universal Pictures. A fair trade for a few hours being petrified by films like Dracula and Frankenstein. We belong dead. The former, as film scholar Robert Prechter notes, was a fitting allegory for the perceived fear of the day, that the aristocrat was sucking the blood of the common people. Over the next few years, Universal followed those up with classics like The Invisible Man, Bride of Frankenstein, and The Mummy, all of which were smash hits. That's right, they made a mummy film without Brendan Fraser in it, and people still turned up. <coughs> and of course, other studios quickly hopped on the burgeoning genre's bandwagon, with Paramount's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde making serious bank. Similarly, RKO's King Kong became an absolute monster of a monster movie. Horror films of the time were, according to film scholar John Towson, defined by their gruesomeness and brutality. As scholar David J. Scull puts it, this was a time when all of the promises of the Roaring Twenties and the faith in progress in science just crashed and burned. He notes the popularity of the mad scientist figure as a stand-in for the experts and eggheads who had failed to save the economy, as well as the image of Frankenstein as a stand-in for the abandoned proletariat. But curiously, midway through the 30s, as the country emerged from the depression, the horror boom quickly fizzled out. That's in part due to the more strict enforcement of censorship via the Hayes Production Code. Still, there were almost no horror movies made in the US between 1937 and 1938, and few being made anywhere else either. It seems then that people's hunger for horror was inspired, at least in part, by the hardships they were facing outside the theater. And this isn't an isolated example. The 1970s was also an era marked by anxiety and unrest. At home, Americans were dealing with energy crises, economic downturn, and rising crime rates. Don't even get us started on how this decade is considered the golden age of serial killers. 
And from abroad, they were being beamed images of the savage violence and incomprehensible terror which was the Vietnam War. With all this weighing on the collective consciousness, the 70s produced another wave of iconic horror films which were hungrily devoured by their audience. Movies like the Amityville Horror and The Exorcist topped the box office for their respective years. Popular horror films of the time again reflected existing societal anxieties. As Stephen King notes in Dance Macabre, his nonfiction book on the horror genre, The Exorcist isn't just about the devil. Rather, it is a film about explosive social change, a finely honed focusing point for that entire youth explosion that took place in the late 60s and early 70s. Similarly, the New York Times notes how films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween had something important in common. They had more to do with what was going on outside the studio than inside it. In this way, they expressed the same horrors folks were seeing unfold on the nightly news. And we've seen exactly the same phenomenon occur in the last couple of years. While the box office as a whole has been throttled by lockdowns, you'll still find the likes of The Quiet Place 2, The Forever Purge, Malignant, and Old amongst recent top performers. In fact, in 2020, horror took home its biggest share of the box office in modern history. And the series like Fear Street and Midnight Mass made major splashes. Plus, Squid Game unexpectedly became Netflix's biggest ever debut. A reported 111 million viewers tuned in. They luxuriated in its brutal commentary on economic inequality and the deathly cutthroat competition of global capitalism. You can also check out our recent video on Squid Game's apt depiction of the modern debt crisis. So while it's highly debatable whether hard times toughen us up, they certainly seem to make us horror fans. So why are we drawn to slashers and creature features during such difficult times? Well, the answer might lie in how our brains respond to these kinds of films. That's according to Sally Winston, executive director of the Anxiety and Stress Disorders Institute of Maryland. She explains that while watching horror films, your heart pumps and the adrenaline flows and your attention narrows in. That's even though you know that you're not really in danger. Behind you. This basically means that we can enjoy the rush of a good scare without the distress it would cause in reality. And how much you enjoy this jolt seems to depend heavily on how your brain is wired. Rutgers professor of psychiatry, David Zald, suggests that some people seem to be built without breaks on the dopamine their brain releases, allowing them to experience a serious terror high. We also then get to ride a wave of relief as we recover from each fright and remember that we aren't actually in danger. This is a phenomenon known as excitation transfer theory, which suggests that the heightened state one stimuli puts us into also strengthens the sensation that follows. So basically, the higher a movie raises our heart rate, the more satisfying it is to feel it coming back down. All of this also speaks to the idea of catharsis, which we at Wisecrack talk about a lot. Catharsis, a term first coined by Aristotle, describes the way art allows us to fully experience emotions by proxy. It expresses modern man and all his self-pity. Anyway, this only explains why we enjoy horror films in general, not why we seek them out in terms of real life terror. And the answer to that might be that these movies actually make us better able to deal with fear in real life. A Finnish study used a magnetic resonance image scanner to monitor brain activity while watching a horror movie. They found that as the movie builds tension, the parts of the brain involved in visual and auditory perception become more active as we scan the screen for potential threats. Then, the shock we have been anticipating delivers. That's when the regions responsible for emotion processing and threat evaluation fire up. Those are the same sections you'd count on when making a rapid, high-stakes decision. Like, what to do when a dude starts chasing you with a chainsaw. In effect, Horror movies can provide a form of exposure therapy by putting us in situations where we face our fears in an environment of safety and control. And it's one in which we can push a button and make it all go away. A recent study even found that people who suffer from anxiety are, paradoxically, more likely to be drawn to horror movies, possibly for this exact reason. Indeed, extensive research has found this process hugely beneficial for people suffering from anxiety, OCD, or PTSD. It enables them to experience control over and better process their fears, thus decreasing anxiety. So at a time where we all have more reasons than usual to be perpetually anxious, it kind of makes sense that we would dive into horror films to prepare ourselves. It could save your life. This idea was borne out by a recent study from the University of Chicago. It found that putting our brains and bodies through hell voluntarily gets them in perfect shape for a very involuntary event like, say, a mother plague. 
Measuring how a range of American adults responded to the pandemic, researchers found that those with a predilection for horror flicks generally coped better. They displayed a higher degree of resilience and found themselves more able to continue enjoying life in spite of, you know, everything. And this trend has continued throughout the pandemic, with a 2020 survey of Now TV users finding that horror fans were less daunted by the prospect of an imminent second wave. And, well, good for them. And fans of pandemic-related and dystopian horror in particular reportedly also felt more prepared for the realities of the Panini. After all, these films provide them with a few pieces of practical advice, stock up on essentials, aim for the head, etc. What's more, unsettling sights like empty supermarket shelves and deserted streets likely didn't feel nearly as shocking to connoisseurs of the genre. As it turns out, even the end of the world is a lot less scary the second or 20th time around. But it's not just what horror films do on an individual psychological level. It's the shared experience of collectively watching and being haunted by the same nightmares. Horror has always been an immensely social genre. One of the reasons it performs so well at the box office is that these are movies we want to witness together, even if it's only to laugh a little at the person who's screaming the loudest. It's usually me. Watching something scary as part of an audience taps into one of our most basic human instincts, to seek safety in numbers. Viewing horror films in a group provides us with an added layer of reassurance. If the little girl from the ring pops out of the screen and tries to snatch us, maybe she'll grab someone sitting in another row instead. This theory of horror movies bringing us closer together was even bolstered by a University of Alberta study in 2009. In it, people in a control group who watched The Shining were more attracted to messages of communal togetherness and affiliation than the control group that watched Richard Linklater's Before Sunrise. And that's really saying something, because who among us has not dreamed of communal togetherness with Ethan Hawke and or Julie Delphi? If you know what I mean. Once you've sat together and watched Michael Myers use a kitchen knife to nail a full-grown human being to a wall, you've established a sense of community, even if that community disperses when the credits start to roll. I'll be right back! So the world still seems to be crumbling around us, but at least we have Freddy and Jason and now the masked crowd at the movie theater to help us through the hardest times. Naturally, horror films will never be everyone's idea of a fun Friday night. For some people, the anxiety induced by the scares simply isn't worth the relief that comes afterwards. And if Disney musicals or 90s rom-coms are the balm you need to make it through this crazy world, then go for it. But for all you adorable freaks who love looking at blood and guts, horror might just be the psychological equivalent of a weighted blanket. But what do you guys think? Will you be spending Halloween filling your eyeballs with all the horror you can? Or does a quiet night of Great British Baking Show sound more your speed? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks as always to our patrons for all your support. Check out our podcast, or I'll haunt your dreams. Stab that subscribe button like it just had sex in an 80s slasher movie, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.